So another champion of midlife women um, is Eleanor Mills, who's our guest today. She's an award-winning editor, journalist, writer, and broadcaster, and she's the founder of Noon, which really attracted our interest. It's the online community that empowers women in midlife. Eleanor worked for the Sunday Times for 23 years as editorial director, editor of the Sunday Times magazine, and as a columnist and interviewer. And I love this. You've interrogated everyone from Mikhail Gorbachev to Sheryl Sandberg and Theresa May. God, I bet you could tell some stories. Um, Now, working on her first novel and living in London with her two teenage daughters and husband. And I believe that you founded Noon after feeling that you'd lost your purpose, like so many of us in midlife, as our kids leave and our relationships change. And Noon was born out of your desire to help women find a new path through midlife and beyond to change the narrative. Love that. Let's change the narrative today. Yeah, Welcome, well, Eleanor. That was, oh, thank you so much for having me. Really nice to meet you both. And yes, I feel really passionately that we need a new story about women and what they're capable of from kind of 45 and beyond. And I really started to feel that while working at the top of the mainstream media where I'd been, you know, commissioning all sorts of things. And I began to find it was very difficult to get articles into the paper about my peer group as I began to hit 50. And that also when I commissioned um, interviews, even with really famous um, older actresses or things like that, Um, often there would be a real pushback from the picture desk or from other editors saying, oh, no, can't we have a picture of her when she was younger? And there was a real sense in the media that women were there to what my one picture editor famously said to me to brighten up a page. We said, I'll brighten up the page, which meant putting a picture of a pretty girl. And that when they didn't think we were brightening up the page quite so much, they weren't so keen on the content, which I thought was ridiculous because... Actually, if you look at all the demographics and the numbers, women 45 plus are behind over 90% of all household consumer spending decisions. So I realised that there was something very necessary in terms of a recalibration of how the world saw the women in midlife, because I felt that the kinds of portraits that I was getting from the mainstream media were not in keeping with the women that I saw about me, didn't reflect what I call queen ages and this massive shift into a new chapter, uh, which we see is so possible um, at kind of 45, 50 plus. And what we found in a big piece of research that we did with Noon with the management consultants Accenture was that it was very noticeable that over half of women by the time they hit 50 have been through at least five massive life events, divorce, bereavement, redundancy, elderly parents coming to bits, teenagers with kind of mental health difficulties, their their own issues, of course, a bit of menopause as well. Um, but that those... What we also saw was that um, that that created a huge amount of wisdom that we talk about the Queen Ages as being kind of forged in fire for having been through all that stuff. But that all those things tended to hit in what we call a midlife collision or um, a midlife maelstrom. They all kind of happened at once. And that would really derail women. And but what we also saw was that after they got through that kind of collision, kind of crisis point, they then moved on to be much happier. Um, And actually Mm. the women who'd been through the most then had their lives set up exactly the way they wanted them. And I didn't really see anything in the wider uh, world which was actually talking about that narrative, which was saying, yes, you know, when you hit 45, 50, you will hit this crossroads in your life. Everything will seem to fall apart. But actually in the clearing, the, the clearing out that those kind of, so it can be sad those kind of endings bring there's a possibility for a recreation for a new chapter for a new growth and it is really possible to move into a really new purposeful fulfilling chapter in your life uh but that you have to be you have to kind of be be prepared for it or you have to have somebody holding your hand or saying this isn't going to last forever this isn't the end of the world because it feels like the end of the world I and mean, for me i've been doing a big job for 23 years and suddenly that was over so it was a huge kind of identity crisis and at the same time my children went off to university and i was like well who am i if i'm not this sunday times woman and totally. i'm not mum and I think that that there's so many women can relate to that and therefore I really set up noon and I called it noon because in the 100 year life 50 is halfway through 
um, and it was that sense of that midpoint. And I, I called it that to give women a sense that it's OK. You know, you will hit these pinch points, these troublesome moments, but there's good life afterwards. And if we can kind of hold your hand through that, don't give up hope. We can find you a new tribe. We can support you into what I think can be a really shiny, fantastic new chapter. But there's nothing about that in the wider cultural narrative. And our generation of women is really a pioneering one. There haven't been women who have kind of worked all the way through or have the kind of independent kind of mindedness that I think a lot of what I call queen ages have now. And we see that in the statistics. Um, and so we are a new cohort and we need a new story. And so I set up Noon really because I could see that the mainstream weren't going to do it. And I really wanted to I wanted to create the kind of site that would have helped me when I left the Sunday Times. And I can remember it takes Googling. takes a strong woman, doesn't it, to come up with an idea. And I think what you've just been describing... There's been it's remarkable how much different topics are now discussed in the wider uh, media and broadcasting and for women. We talk about the menopause. We talk about going back to work and all these things. But a lot of it is done with a certain amount of negativity. Oh, isn't the menopause yeah. awful? Oh, isn't it awful that we lose our confidence and we feel really crap when our kids leave home? And your hand holding through what you're doing and the movement that you've started and we totally support is about saying, Thanks. actually... This is really cool, this midpoint. This is, this is a pivot in our lives where we can suddenly grasp joy, we can reinvent, we can be what we want to be and pulling on that muscle memory of, of the wisdom of what we've learned throughout our lives and, and what we bring to the table being negotiators at home and, and mini corporate CEOs of our family and the buying power and, you know, we're bringing so much more into the economy. We can't lose this valuable, valuable source of employment and um, just strength. So, I mean, Liz and I, we, we love what you've been doing. We've been following it for some time. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> you've had some very interesting people who clearly support you. Like, um, I was looking at uh, an interview that you did with Laura Kunzberg. Um Yes. That must have been fun because she's so, one feisty woman. Love her. Yes, Calls people to account. Said, she very proudly said that she was proud to be a queen ager. So I'm really glad. Um, I mean, I, that's an, uh, a, a term that I came up with. I've spent so many years writing headlines and things. And it just seemed to me that it was really important that we had a kind of bit of a rebrand of women at this point. Um, what we also see very strongly at noon is that although the women want doctors to know what they're talking about and they don't want it to be a taboo, they do not want to be seen through a menopausal lens. Um, I talk a lot about queen ages not walking hot flushes. And I think that there's a bit of a danger at the moment that the menopause conversation has become the only conversation about women of around 50. And of course, for the 25% who have a terrible time during menopause, I, and I understand that that becomes all very, you know, very kind of dominating. But I also think it's important that we don't terrify all the women coming up behind us. And oh, we're also this is on board. <laughs> we're also realistic about the fact that actually for 75 percent of women three quarters you know it's not the most comfortable you get the odd hot flush but it's not a disaster and actually you come through menopause quite quickly after the perimenopause and then you're freer and biologically kind of less kind of burdened than you've ever been in your life so the idea that all women of 50 plus are now seen through a kind of hot sweaty menopause lens makes me really cross because i think that actually it plays into gendered ageism and it puts us back say. into a hysterical kind of biological box when actually we're escaping that and these could be or should be women's really fantastic years in terms of their creativity and their possibilities and their purpose um and yet too often now i think we're seen as kind of past it and you know sweaty and menopausal and i really don't like that narrative and you don't want to terrify the younger women come up as you said my, like our daughters you know that they, they like the fact that we're, we're being positive about being middle-aged and are doing something and i think that's what's so inspirational what you're doing is is telling them that it's not all over at 55 or i'm nearly 60 you know it, it's a whole new life out there i think we also need to avoid terrifying employers too mm. because we have so much to offer if we make it seem like oh you've got to have a menopausal woman in your workplace and i do agree with making these changes these alterations to make it easier for us to go back into work or 
start our own jobs, start our own companies and so on. But we don't want to terrify them either. There's, I think there's like a, a level we need to find. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I totally agree. Because I think that what's happened is that a lot of big corporate companies, and there was a very good article actually in The Atlantic last week by Helen Lewis, talking about how a menopause has become a kind of multi-trillion dollar industry. And I think that what's happening is that big business always likes to put women back into a kind of hysterical biological box and sell them things. And the last thing I want is hot pink menopause kind of uh, shampoo or, or skin cream or anything like that, or clothing ranges or kind of Le Creuset, all of which are kind of being pushed at us. We absolutely need health equity. We need doctors to know what they're doing. There are still some huge intersectional issues around menopause. The poorest women in the UK get are half as likely to get access to HRT than the richest when it comes to women of colour. It's a complete disaster zone. So there are definite massive kind of health problems. If we look at the Invisible Women, um, Caroline Criado Perez kind of stuff, there's definitely issues there. But I think the problem is that this has become the only lens through which older women are seen. And I don't think it's an accident that just as a whole generation of women should be becoming CEOs, kind of um, being taken to the kind of management table. Instead, we're being put in a kind of sweaty menopause box because that, of course, leaves all the big jobs to the men. And I really think that there's there's an issue there and it's something that we're not talking about. And as often happens with women, things which are supposed to help us end up kind of killing us with kindness or putting us in a kind of victim box. So why do you think that's happening then? So you're quite right. There's women who've come through the ranks. They've got great knowledge. They could be CEOs. They may resign because they can't cope for one reason or another or have decided those life choices are not for them. Do you think it's do you do you think it's being driven by men then who are trying to keep hold of their part in in leadership or is it a whole mixture of things? more subtle than that i think that the whole way that uh hierarchies within kind of corporates and within work and within leadership is set up are set up on a male model um i saw that very clearly within newspapers which is a very kind of macho environment uh, and I also you also see it all over the city and all over politics. And so if you look at like um, Helen McNamara at the Select Committee last week and the, 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 her description of what the centre of power in Downing Street was like during COVID and the lack of female voices and the lack of women's point of view in policy making. Let's not forget women of 51 percent of the population were also doing all the caring and the educating during that time. And yet we were not being not being listened to or heard at all. I don't think that the corridors of power have yet opened themselves up to women in the way that the lower ranks of work have. And that's very clear in the in all the statistics. I'm also on the global steering committee of the 30 percent club, which is the biggest campaign for gender equality in the world. And what we see is actual levels of women with their hands on levers kind of with executive function being stuck at about 12 14 percent i mean as a columnist and a journalist i've been writing about this for about the last 20 years and it's not moving that that dial it will take 150 years to get to parity at the top so the point is we're still within a very male paradigm at the top of leadership in the professions in business in politics even though women have been entering a lot of those professions in the same numbers as men for the last 30 years so there's something about what we still think a leader looks like um, which is not very kind of welcoming to women. And I also think that this kind of menopause stuff is a way of ruling women out or making us look weak and kind of non -wor not worthy just at the point where we should be breaching the citadel. So I think it's really complicated. A great old mentor of mine, um, a brilliant economist called Sylvia Ann, Ann Hewlett, talks about the men circling the wagons at the top. Um, and it's also very clear when you do a lot of work with corporates, which I do, where um, you go, OK, well, you need you need some more women on your board. And you kind of look around, you go, well, you know, who's going? Who's making the space? They're mm. never, very keen, they're never very keen on that. Fancy that. <laughs> so how can we change this, though? I mean, obviously, you're, you're, you're doing your best, but, you know, it, that's, that sounds wrong. But, you know, it, it's not changing quick enough, is it? It's frustrating it's for... Not, for, for it's definitely not changing quick enough. And the argument has been, because um, I've kind of been around this block quite a few times, the argument has been that um, time 
will do it you know that once you've got women entering the workforce in the same numbers that as time goes on you know it will even up but that's not happening and actually there are less women coming through in the pipeline now than there were like five ten years ago because we're part of what my friend i've got a very senior friend who's a very top lawyer and she says she said to me eleanor you and i are the hand on the ass generation you know we were kind of used to kind of putting up with all sorts of treatment that we shouldn't have had and we were quite tough about it but actually the the generation coming through behind us are not prepared to put up with that and they're walking much they're walking out much earlier than than many of us did and what what a lot of companies are seeing and in fact um Hanneke Schmitz, who's the global chair of the 30% club, was saying last week to the UN, is that we're seeing a, a, a queen ager brain drain. So we're getting women back into work after they have kids. There's a huge amount of focus on maternity. And then they're hitting kind of 45, 50, and they're leaving in droves. And that's partly, I think, because when you get to this point, you've got options. You know, if you stuck it out in a big job till you're like nearly 50, you, you've got enough kind of probably financial independence to be able to go and do something else if you want to. And they just get sick of playing the kind of corporate game and having to be like handmaidens and be nice to people and kind of, um, you know, suck up and do all that kind of internal politics, which actually just get to a point you're just like, I cannot be bothered. I know I'm good at my job. Mm. I've been doing this for 25 years. You know, I've won lots of prizes. I'm, you know, I, I know that I can do this. And then when some kind of younger male boss is like, oh, well, I don't think that's a good idea, or let's do this. And you're like, well, no, there was a reshuffle, you know, there was a reorganisation 10 years ago and they tried that and it didn't work. I think you just get to a point where you're a bit more bullshit. You're like, actually, I just don't, I can't be bothered to play this game. And so the women, walk, you know, vote with their feet or they get um, or they get whacked. I mean, certainly in the media and the advertising and marketing, there's vanishingly few women over 50 um, only 6% of advertising and marketing people are over 50 and only 2% of them are women. Um, so there's a real kind of problem in a lot of those industries, which also kind of, you know, plays against us. Uh, and I was really shocked. I thought when I looked at the demographics around queen ages and how much money we control, it would be a no brainer to say to brands, you need to be representing us because our research showed that um, with our you know, queen ages would be 70% more likely to buy from a brand that represented them and that they're sitting on huge amounts of disposable wealth, much more than any other demographic. But companies want the queen age of pound but they don't want to represent us because the people who you're often making the decisions about the marketing and the advertising are are younger and so they, they don't understand they don't get it so, so some of this marketing so some of it i mean for 50s i mean think how many different um different oh. kind of cohorts there are in over 50 i mean it's madness hmm. There's a lot of tokenism, isn't there, in the representation of women in, I don't know, shampoo adverts or using a body wash or something. And I, I, sometimes I just feel like they're ticking the box, they're ticking the Benetton mm -hmm. box of diversity and body shape and age. And it just doesn't but feel the bit real. The bit that's missing always is age. So, you know, they'll do people with tattoos, fat people, thin people, you know, br um, brown people, white people, like, I mean, any any kind of possible bit of diversity, um, disabled people, but but not, uh, not older people. It's a good point. Yeah. I mean, I, I love, thought of that. there's a couple of really good mo movements now, isn't there? Uh, look my age, ageism is never in style. It's good to see women coming together and really talking about it because talking about it is the best kind of start for anything really isn't it to get to get it into conversations within the household and to to normalize it yeah but it's i think so i, I, I think this whole concept, concept, how do you get the change it, how do you do it i think this whole concept of gender and ageism hasn't really been thought about at all i mean i took i go into quite a lot of companies and i talk about this quite a lot on a kind of national platform when people go gender and ageism kind of what's that and i explain it's where ageism meets sexism and I still think that there's a massive double standard between the way that older women are perceived and older men are perceived. So men are seen to age like silver foxes, um, you know, they, oh, they yes. like, George like Cooney. fine wine. Yeah, all like fine wine getting better, you know, but getting better with the years. Whereas women are seen to age like peaches, you know, one wrinkle and we're in the bin. And then you look at the kinds of women that you see um reflected back at you in the mainstream and then now a few kind of older women who you're allowed to see if you think of kind of like martha stewart at 80 on the front of sports illustrated in a bikini i mean not wonderfully representative 
or all the old supermodels on the cover of Vogue, although they dress them up to so they all look really kind of frumpy. Or you're allowed Helen Mirren because she always looks fabulous, even though she's older. So, so the kind of level of pulchritude um, required to, as an older woman to appear in the public eye is kind of off the scale. I mean, I used to see this when mm. I, I did a lot of TV. And if you're a woman, you go on telly. They take forever to kind of, you know, do your makeup and do your hair so that you look kind of appropriate to go on Good Morning Britain or Lorraine or something. You have some hideous man who's way older. He comes in, they give him a dusting of powder and send him straight on. So there's a, like there's just a massive kind of double standard in the way that we see things. And I think that people aren't even aware of that until you start pointing it out to them. So I'm a great believer that by talking about things, by changing the story, by challenging it and pointing up, the double standard, which I've been doing a lot. I just wrote an article about um, how Madonna was being ca castigated and told she needed to grow up for kind of prancing around in her, you know, suspenders on stage. Nobody ever tells Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones they need to they need so to grow true. up. Yeah. And they're, they're yeah. like 25 years older than Madonna. So I just think that we need to kind of keep pointing up these these stereotypes and this double standard and keep going on about it till people begin to feel that it's as unacceptable to make a gendered ageist remark even something like saying oh you look good for your age i mean that's actually incredibly <gasps> hate that. rude yeah it I hate is. that but we need to start challenging that um i'm on the board of something called the um center for aging better and they're doing a big campaign around which is around challenging people's internal ageism um, and the way, and which is a crazy thing if you think about it, it's it's a kind of form of prejudice against your future self. Um, and I also think that by extending the runway for older women and talking about this, we also really help all the women coming up behind us because all the 30, 40 something women I talk to are absolutely kind of, you know, killing themselves. They're trying to kind of have kids and hold down jobs. There's just so much which is trying to be crammed into those years. And if we can extend this runway saying, actually, we can go on being productive and have good jobs and go on being powerful till we're kind of 70, then that really extends the time that there is for all this stuff and i think really takes the pressure off younger women in fact, i had a really lovely comment on my newsletter i do a um, newsletter called the queen ager every week on substack and i had a lovely comment yesterday from a younger woman saying i can't tell you how much i love your newsletters because they make me look for make me look forward to the idea of being a queen ager that life gets better and it also really helps me understand my mom and what she's been through so i also think that there's a real opportunity for the generations to understand each other better through these conversations we get that a lot on the podcast yeah. don't we that you know it's not just midlife women who listen to us there's a lot yes. of younger women as well and like oh now I know what's coming but I think often in women's history we fought the battles for the next generation we're fighting them now and we make a certain amount of progress but we're always fighting for the next one and the next one after that until we really can make some traction aren't we so it's exhausting, but it's good work. It's it's important well, work that we're all doing. Part of, this is part of that kind of, you know, feminist narrative, which hasn't really been talked about till now. Um, and I think that that's partly because we're a very different kind of generation hitting midlife. It's why you're getting all the conversation around menopause that women are get, women of my generation are getting there and going, what the hell? You know, none of this has been sorted out yet. Doctors don't know what they're talking about. Um, uh, but also a sense of what we're good, we're supposed to just disappear and like enter you know exit stage left because we hit fifty. Uh, I don't think so because there's a whole load of us who are used to having our voices heard, who've commanded good jobs, who've had a different kind of equality to the to that which our mothers had or the women who came before us. And so I think we're just going. Uh, don't think so. Don't think that works. Um, and so I, th I do think that there is a big shift going on, and you see it in the statistics. So in the 2019 census women over 40 started earning more money than women under 40 for the first time ever in 2019. So this is a massive kind of social shift going on. Um, over half of the women who, um, what I call queen ages, are the main breadwinners in their family. Um, we're, mm -hmm. we're a different kind of independent-minded woman with agency. And I think that that is also what's driving this new conversation around age. Mm -hmm. You, what was the statistic that you found about uh, the women making decisions? In uh, well, it was ninety percent, ninety three percent of women British from age forty to sixty make um, all of the financial decisions in the family. Is that right? In the household? Yeah, I think that's yeah, what yeah. I it's heard. 
Yes, it's it's That's ninety three very high. Percent. Yeah, it's one of my figures. It's ninety three percent of women forty five to sixty five are behind. Uh, they're, they're behind ninety three percent of all the main household consumer spending decisions and that's because if you think about it, it makes sense i mean in my family i make decisions for me and for my husband but also for my parents increasingly and for my um team mm. and for my children who are kind of in their 20s i'm paying for their bills at university i'm helping out you know i'm helping out my my folks i'm thinking you know my mum was reading me this morning going oh, she wants to go away next year where should she go so i'm beginning to um, I'm, I'm, I'm making decisions kind of both up and down the generations with that really important kind of, you know, middle layer. And yet the sandwich think, generation, as we're known, right? Yeah, I, I think that's that, I mean, that's more about caring, isn't it? That's more about kind of we're looking after the grandparents and the and the um, and the kids. And I also think what's interesting is you can be 50 now and have kids who are at university or, like, or be a grandmother or you could have kids who are still at primary school. I've got a friend who lives around the corner who's older than me, and she's got a four-year-old because a lot of women have had their children late or they're using kind of fertility treatment to have children kind of ex beyond the kind of old biological limits. Uh, Victoria Cora Mitchell last week said that she'd had another baby at kind of 51. So, so we're beginning to see kind of more of that as well. So you can't really predict when you meet somebody who's kind of 50 what stage that, what stage they're going to be at. Um, That's true. And our life expectation is so different, isn't it? You know, at one at one stage, you know, we would be lucky and, and happy to reach 80. But our generation is now quite likely going to be 90 to 100. So as we are in our noon period, our 50s, our midpoint, that's such a lot of years to fill. And I don't think any of us want to be undervalued or lacking in creativity or purpose for half our life to come. We have so much more to give. And it's, yeah. Well, doing something different as well. I think, you know, we're on. The, we're lucky to be here for 80 years or something. Do you really want to do the same thing for 50 years of it? I, I'd, I'd like to do something different. The freedom from when your children it's, leave, such freedom. Exactly, and I think that that's really important. I also think that that's something that people haven't really got their heads around. So in the 100-year life, which, you know, will be, we'll be some of the people who hopefully are, luck, are, long, are lucky enough to live that, then 50 is only halfway through. And the whole way that we need to think about our lives needs to change because we're going to be here for a much longer, much longer time than, you know, all the other models predicted. Mm -hmm. So if you think that the kind of current kind of way that people think about their lives is you kind of get educated and you know established and you go and work maybe for the same place for like you know 30 40 years and then you retire and you kind of play golf and you die I mean that's just so not true and yet no one is really and companies aren't thinking about what you do with older workers um we aren't thinking about the fact that it's very unlikely we're going to go on doing the same thing for all that time you know actually it's going to be very normal to have a midlife pivot or to kind of rethink what you're going to do you know as your kids kind of get bigger and and we all need to kind of future proof ourselves so that we have some skills which means we can go on earning a living kind of as we get older but these conversations are only beginning to happen you know in a way we're the great beneficiaries of the scientific revolution has meant that that has, means that we all live longer every year i think we're adding 18 weeks to our lives globally um but that's all very well but if we're not kind of if we're not factoring that into our decision making our, about our lives or our thinking or our kind of our future proofing of ourselves financing about it. the muscles we need, financing it thinking about the muscles we need to to make transitions which again are not very thought about in our society um then we don't we're not really prepared when those shifts come and that's one of the big things that i'm trying to do at noon is to say to people actually what you need to change from one thing to another is some of the kind of nitty gritty of the paths of people who have gone before. I talk a lot about the kind of the white pebbles in the wood that kind of helped Hansel and Gretel away from the Wicked Witch. You know, what what are the kind of what, what are the stepping stones which help you get from one thing to another thing? So I've run a lot of stories on noon, which are around about that transformation, how you how you go from being one thing and become something else. Um, and also we do a lot of kind of supportive kind of retreats and trips and things like that. And on noon circles um, every month where we really encourage women to support each other through those kind of transitions. It, it really is a great platform. I mean, I, 
Would you agree, Michelle? It really, I, I think it's, it's, it's incredible. It covers so many things yeah. as well, from joy to it's transformation and yeah. careers. Um, I, so well, I say, it's not been around for that long either, has it? It's only a few years. Yeah, we set up, um, I launched it in uh, March 2020, which was exactly oh, a year of good timing. Life, less than something. Yeah, right in the middle of the right in the middle of the pandemic. So I'd actually originally just wanted to kind of run retreats and do more kind of in life stuff. And then because we were all locked down, it became more of a kind of online platform. And I realised that I had to really lean into my journalism background in order to kind of get the community set up. But we're now very much a mixture of an in real life and a virtual uh, community. And um, it's all fueled by the Noon website, which is noon.org.uk. And also um, I, I write a newsletter every week to, to my ladies called The Queen Ager, uh, which is a kind of mixture of my own life and uh, some of the things that we see kind of in the world and in the community. And I've just finished writing a book, which will come out next year. I was just year. Yeah. Ask you. <laughs> What's it called? Which is going to be called, it's called, um, well, at the moment, the working title is So Much More to Come. Uh, which is our kind of strap line at noon. Um, and it's all about the kind of pinch points in midlife and how we get through them. And it's a mixture of my story, but also 50 other women who have reinvented at this point and how they did that and what that looked like for them. So have you any top tips of how people, you know, women can get through midlife? <laughs> well, what, <laughs> what has been most meaningful for me, I think, has been really following the kind of the the crumbs of things which bring me joy i mean it's not an accident that there's a as a, a tab on my website which is about joy so i found that i find when i speak to so many women at this point when you ask them what they really love what really makes them happy and it's an exercise that i often do in my groups of women that a lot of them have kind of forgotten. They've spent so much time looking after everybody else, uh, being what everybody else wants them to be, kind of thinking about what everybody else wants. I mean, I, I can be guilty of that walking around the supermarket. I'm so kind of tuned into what my girls might want, what my husband might want. I've kind of forgotten what I might actually want to eat myself. And I was talking to a friend whose kids had just gone off to university and she's on her own. She's like, as I was walking around the supermarket and I've forgotten what it is that I actually like to eat. So, And I, I, that sounds, well, you know, we're laughing, but it's actually really true. And it's true not just about what you might want to eat, but about what your own life might look like. So one of Very the things much. I think I, go, I say, kind of really go back and think about that woman of 20. You know, what did she really want? What did she really care about? What really got her out of bed in the morning? What were her passions? And then you suddenly see a kind of bulb go off in people's heads. So for me, I've always loved the water. Um, I swim every day in the Hampstead Ladies Pond all the way through the winter. And there's something for me about being in the cold Ooh. water or warm water and being with nature and looking at the heron and seeing the trees. It's just so beautiful today with the kind of yellow leaves and things. So that has really got me back kind of in touch with nature. So I think that that's an incredibly important force. I'm not necessarily wild swimming, but walking or just getting yourself back attached to realising that we're all part of an interconnected world, that we're not kind of isolated, isolated elements, that everything is connected. And I think the first thing to do that, the way you do that is through nature and then really finding other people who are on the same journey at the same time as you because i think what also happens and what we see at noon and we really cr talk about creating a new tribe at this point is so many women kind of feeling a bit lost you know maybe they've had school date friends but they've moved on or they've had lots of work colleagues but you know that they're now not doing that job anymore so they're not kind of around and that's that sense of, i think of really needing some new new friends and being really open to maybe thinking that some of your old dear friends maybe are quite invested in you being as you used to be and aren't necessarily going to be your biggest advocates for change and therefore thinking maybe you need some new kind of accomplices a new tribe to move into your new your new chapter and that's very much what we try and do at noon we try to create tribe through our retreats and through our events i took 15 women walking around the mountains of morocco earlier this year um we walked 75 75 miles in like four or five days it was really quite oh, intense gosh. over mountains and kind of across rivers and i mean and all the women were 50 plus they were really incredible but that was that was a real thing of kind of a we all came back like great friends <laughs> and we'd all seen each other in ways that we never had before but i think there's something about getting out of your comfort zone and doing things that you never thought you were capable of doing which then Ooh. gives you a huge sense of couldn't agree more absolutely 
Yeah. Um, so oh, thank you, thank Eleanor. You've got you are such a force of nature, and love what you're doing. You are the ultimate queen ager, leading us all in in this amazing platform and and awareness and fighting for just a, an equal opportunity and some joy in life. Um, it's been so interesting talking to you. You just like. You make light bulbs come on. It's it's like you spark synapses and you just think, oh, gosh, that's so true. I hadn't thought about it in that way. But thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been really, really good. And where can um, can our listeners find you? Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's really, it's been lovely talking to you. Um, You can find me at um, noon, noon, as in the middle of the day, dot org dot UK is the noon website. Um, and we we're on all um, all kinds of social media. You can find me on LinkedIn and Eleanor Mills, um, and on Instagram we're upon noon uh, is our um, handle there. And there's lots of if you if any of this touches a call with you, there's so much information there. We run a monthly book club. We run monthly noon circles. We have a kind of membership model, but we're really open to um, you know opening that up to people for whom it might be a bit expensive. It's only actually six pounds a month. It's not much more than a coffee. Um, but we're really about trying to support women at midlife to make them feel better about this point to make people realize that there's so much more to come and being a queen ager is great and we want everyone to look forward to being a queen ager as when they come into their prime um and to really change the story that's out there so come and join us and thanks yay. so much for having me. yay queen thank ages thank you <laughs>